Sea Health Services researcher and an associate of the University of Utrecht. Uh, my name is Brian Jarman. Um, I was a general practitioner in London uh, after doing hospital jobs in America and the UK. Um, and then uh, last 10 years I have been involved in the, or I run a thing called the uh, uh, Imperial College Dr. Foster Unit. So we're going to do today something about political pressures uh, on patient safety. What we're trying to do is to identify um, some of the factors that might politically um, impede uh, improvements in quality of care and uh, the consequences these might have. Um, we're looking at this um, with inquiries that have taken place in the, United, in the United Kingdom, which is the ones that uh, I'm dealing with, and also in the United States, Netherlands, and uh, Australia, which uh, Paul is dealing with. There is a pattern in all of the inquiries, and I'll be looking at two of the UK inquiries and uh, comparing them. The, the, the problems of uh, drawing attention to difficulties in medicine is not a new thing. Semmelweis uh, and Virchow and people like that had major problems uh, with these things in the 19th century. Um, some of the problems with uh, politics and medicine are what, how do they interact? Um, what are the political and health care priorities? Are they different? Um, could this be harmful to patients? Uh, and how should healthcare professionals react? The, these are illustrated quite clearly, I think, in the two UK inquiries. The two in inquiries are the Bristol inquiry, which was uh, into pediatric cardiac surgery at that hospital. It was around uh, the year 2000 and, <coughs> 1999 to 2001. Um, this was just one unit of a fairly large hospital. I was the medical member. The inquiry actually had um, 70 people involved, four people on the panel, and I, there was one medic involved, which was myself. Um, just to mention what a public inquiry is. Public inquiry differs from an ordinary inquiry, which might be public or otherwise, but a, a formal public inquiry is one in which you can sub... It is a trial, in fact. It's a legal trial in which you can, uh, you can subpoena witnesses um, it's under law, you know, the Inquiries Act 2005 is the current law. You can subpoena witnesses who must give evidence on oath, um, and they're meant also to volunteer evidence uh, if they consider it relevant to the inquiry. Um, if they don't uh, respond to these things, they can go to jail for up to 51 weeks only. Um, the Midstaff's Inquiry was an inquiry into a hospital um, which covered the entire hospital, not just one individual unit. I have mentioned in the middle of the Harold Shipman inquiry, that was a general practitioner who was thought to have killed at least 215 patients by injecting them with morphine around the time of death. But this is thought to have been uh, probably a unique situation, and it, if you look at the data, it probably could have been picked up by looking at the death rates in, in his particular practice. Now, going to the Bristol Inquiry, this really, probably the sequence of events, is sort of typical of what you get any of these inquiries. It started off in 1986 with the Chief Medical Officer in Wales expressing a concern to the Chief Me Medical Officer in England uh, that he felt that there were problems. This is the number of, query, of concerns that were expressed publicly about the inquiry, and he said it's no secret that it's considered to be one of the worst. Then there was um, a television programme in Wales, and uh, neither of the viewers made any particular complaint. Uh, then there was a local um, inquiry, internal uh, to the region, which actually found more or less the things that we found eventually uh, at the end of our inquiry after three years. We were allocated for our inquiry £42 million, which is quite a large sum. We didn't actually spend it all because of introduction to technology into inquiries. Uh, 
But this, these are major undertakings, and we had a hundred days of hearings in which people came and gave evidence. Giving evidence involves being grilled uh, for a period of about six hours by the inquiry chairman and the inquiry lead barrister, lead, lead counsel, and usually uh, with the evidence that you have submitted beforehand, uh, they would have had a team of maybe half a dozen lawyers working on that evidence for about three weeks. I know how it works because I've been involved in the workings of these inquiries. Um, the uh, investigation that uh, took place locally more or less made the same, had the same findings as we had and more or less had made the same recommendations, but no action was taken. Um, then, I mean, the, the, the particular problems were it was massively underfunded. Uh, it didn't have any, for instance, any intraoperative echocardiograms, and it, there was no full-time pediatric cardiac surgeon even. Then there comes the whistleblower, which you get in uh, most inquiries, often more than one. Steve Bolson was the anaesthetist or anesthesiologist who tried over a period of years with almost every one of the organizations he could go to to draw attention to the problems and he was more or less told that you don't do that in this hospital and you probably don't do that in England and he found it was best in the end to go to Australia, which he did. Then, before he went, he gave his data to our satirical magazine, Private Eye. It's not generally read, but they um, published six reports in 1992, and that increased the public interest um, in, in what was going on at Bristol. And eventually, patients got involved. There was one article later on in the Daily Taylor from the National Press, and then there was a, an external inquiry. Uh, two paediatric cardiac surgeons came along for one month, investigated the hospital, saw quite clearly what was wrong, made it recommendations, and what happened was that the death rate, which the previous four years had been 29%, after a few years dropped to 3%. And you can see the pattern of the dropping here. It's just gone from 29% to 8% to 3.5%. And the national death rate also dropped. And the, the point there was that the patients and the parents of the patients, the people who died, the children who died, said, at least could you have told us that there was another hospital nearby where we could have had a mortality of 8% or something like that. Uh, one hour's drive up the motorway, we could have taken our children there. And I felt as a doctor... Uh, involved in that inquiry that we as a medical profession do have a duty to make that information available to patients. One of our conclusions, uh, the inquiry report is available on the web, it's 12,000 pages, it's quite a long read, but one uh, paragraph from it was that in short there was no effective national system for monitoring uh, outcomes, the situation is compounded by the fact that Every organization that thought, people thought was responsible said it was something else. And it was really like, we, we, when we were sitting on the inquiry, we'd, say, we'd have the Royal College of this, we would have the department uh, unit in, in charge of this, and so on. And each one, each day, passed the parcel to somebody else. No one seemed to be in charge of what was going on. And our conclusion also was... We would like to say this could not happen again, but unless lessons, unless lessons are learned, it certainly could happen again, if not in the area of pediatric and cardiac surgery, in some other area of care. Now, the Mid-Staffs Inquiry, as I say, is a whole hospital. The, the problem there was that it had high adjusted death rates, this standardised mortality ratio, hospital standardised mortality ratio, for at least nine years, and it had also had a number of mortality alerts. And at this point there, the Health Care Commission decided to have an investigation. Um, it appears that the mortality has dropped uh, quite significantly, obviously there's a difference between this point here and that one there, uh, after the uh, investigation, but that is partly as a result of a, a mortality reduction program, but partly because of the fact that 
that they changed 80% um, of their coding, uh, particularly of palliative care. Now, the model that we were using then and are still using uh, involves adjusting for palliative care. And this meant uh, that they had, they suddenly overnight, when the inquiry was announced, changed their coding of palliative care to all, from almost nothing to um, about 10 times the national value. And that had an effect of reducing their HSMR by about uh, seven points, about 7%. The ind indications were the high mortality and these mortality alerts, which I'll mention a little later. And uh, this is a sort of brief summary of some of the things that were found. It was uh, uh, in the inquiry that followed, they were actually, you have to be clear, there actually were two inquiries. Um, one was an independent inquiry, but not a public one, which reported in February 2010. And these are some of the conclusions that come from that area. But then, towards the end of 2010, there was a public inquiry announced, and that is still going on, and that will report probably in October this year, not, as we thought, in June, according to a message I had today. So, <coughs> the... The only final report that we have at the moment is the independent inquiry and um, the chair of both was Robert Francis QC and his comments were that, um, that there was uh, a high HSMR at mid-staffs um, and it's quite clear that the doctors did express concern but they weren't able to do very much about it. But finally and perhaps of most importance, I found a widespread culture of denial. And I think that is a characteristic of all of these factors. It's, it is actually too difficult to accept the very bright light that the assessments and mortality shows. Um, I, I think, I was think, trying to think of uh, the, um, the poem by uh, T.S. Eliot, uh, the, it, it's actually um, the one where he says, humankind can only bear uh, a, a small amount of mortality, uh, of reality. Um, it comes from uh, Bernd Norton in, in one of his uh, four quartets. And I think that is the situation, that it is very difficult for us to take a very clear uh, investigation or evidence of problems with adjusted death rate. Um, one of the things that was important was the question of the involvement of patients. The difficulty when patients make complaints is that they are often told, yours is a unique situation, it is not a pattern, and they cannot put it together they uh, then feel disempowered and, in fact, patient, uh, all these complaints from patients are not very well dealt with at the moment in the UK. They are actually trying to change their situation, but we haven't got there yet. Uh, but when they, are, when they see information being published that puts together adjusted mortalities, then they can start making uh, their voice heard, and that's what actually happened at Stafford. So we started sending these mortality alerts in in uh, April 2007, actually. And they had a lot in the year after that. And then towards the end of 2007, uh, in December, a patient group started and was able to draw attention to the problems and eventually uh, led to uh, the public inquiry. And this also, I think, uh, influenced the government's new white paper, which came out in 2010, which was uh, emphasize, I think learning from both Bristol and Mid-Staffs uh, and emphasizing the importance of enshrining improvements in healthcare outcomes as the central purpose of the National Health Service. That is what we are meant to be doing now. Um, the focus on outcomes is as opposed to the, fo the focus on process measures, or as Americans say, process measures. Um, we feel, and it is thought now, that it is important to look at the outcomes which are relevant to the patient. The processes by which the healthcare professionals get to that point is of less importance and also not so easy to measure. The advantage of measuring death rates is that they are a definite event, uh, they have to be recorded by law, and they are obviously related to quality of care. So the way we do this hospital standardised mortality ratio, basically we adjust for 
um, the diagnoses lead to 80% of deaths. It's more or less the same as using 100% of deaths. And now the NHS, the Department of Health, has agreed that we will use a measure similar to that covering 100% of deaths. Actually, the coefficient the correlation between them is 0.983. So they are very, very similar. But it will also add newer one uh, deaths 30 days after discharge, which um, is interesting, but not so easy to do on a continuous monthly basis. Um, one of the things which is important is that we have published this information in national newspapers ever since 2001. So the information with regard to mid-staffs has been available to anyone who read an, a national newspaper from then onwards. And it is now published, as from 2009, they are published monthly as well in the NHS Choices website. The things we adjust for, the main ones, are actually age group, uh, admission method, that's emergency or elective, and the diagnostic groups. But there are a range of other factors that we include. And we do now include, as a result of pressure from certain hospitals to include it, uh, whether or not the patient has, um, is coded as, or is considered to have palliative care, but the actual definition of that um, has changed and it's quite a, a difficult subject. I'd even call it a tricky subject. Um, the independent assessment of whether that's of any interest or not, this hospital standardised mortality ratio, HSMR, um, perhaps comes from the National Survey of Patients. It's carried out every year. I think it's about 150,000 patients are uh, asked questions. And the strongest association with HSMRs is, would you recommend this hospital to your family and friends? If you would recommend it, you're likely to have a hospital with a low HSMR. But a range of other factors which also give a similar strong correlation at uh, less than 0.001. We've calculated this, uh, these HSMRs in different countries. Um, Netherlands has been fairly active. Canada has been particularly active. Some of them do them on a monthly basis. Um, there are limitations. They are only adjusted death rates. Um, they're not a direct measure of quality of care. I don't know of any direct measure of quality of care that I, I've, I've known, but I think it certainly should be based on outcomes if there is one. And we all, always tell people that accuracy of coding, uh, we have recently added the possibility of manipulation of the data, uh, chance variation and uh, the adjustment model. And it's possible the HSMRs, I would think about a quarter of the uh, variation is actually chance variation. So the report from the Healthcare Commission was... Uh, that uh, we should, uh, there was a trigger from the HSMR and the Department of Health, when the report came out, said that it's a trigger to ask hard questions. Don't ignore your high HSMR until you've sorted out what the issues are. Um, there is a question, obviously, of you know, who is actually ultimately responsible for having some method of uh, assessing what's going on in our hospitals. And... At the end of the Bristol inquiry, the Department of Health said that it accepts that it is responsible and has the ultimate responsibility uh, for having systems in place. Now, it obviously can't do the whole loss itself, so it delegates this mainly to the strategic health authorities, but to a certain extent to the primary care trusts, both of which are being uh, uh, abandoned uh, or disbanded as a result of the new white paper. Um, but they are responsible for the performance management of, uh, of acute hospital and primary care trusts. Now, there exists in England, uh, right up until, uh, until the white paper, 25 organisations which, in theory, in some way or another, are responsible for monitoring the quality of care in the National Health Service. Um, the Care Quality Commission was previously called the Health Care Commission, Monitor monitors the quality of foundation trusts in some different ways. Primary care trusts, strategic health authorities, all the patient groups, the oversight committees, the NHS litigation authority, general medical council, nursing council, health and safety executive, and so on and so on. And the question is, why didn't we come to an answer? Why do these groups not come to an answer? Our results were being published for seven years. 
but why was no decision taken beforehand to look into the problems? And the Healthcare Commission report, when it came out on the 18th of May, said the SHA, Street Health Authority, was not aware of any concerns regarding the quality of services provided by the Trust before our publication, Dr. Foster Intelligence and Padre's Hospital Guide, in April 2002. Now, why did those 25 organizations not have some inkling that there could be a problem? But the answer is, of course, they did have an inkling. And that is where we get to the difficulty of facing too much reality. These HSMRs were published uh, every year and were high for nine years. But in the guidance to the minister, when this report came out, it said, say, and this is, these are revealed by emails in the uh, inquiry, you should say that the guide was only available in 2007, in brackets, it was available from 2001, a lie. Now, every person who gave evidence from the Department of Health to the inquiry said they are only available from 2007. But when I was questioned, they said to me, you know, who should have known about that? And I, I said, well, anyone who reads national newspapers should have known. And that is obviously the case. So this is an independent inquiry, and there is uh, a statement that there was definite public concern, and therefore it's felt that there should be a further investigation. That's how we got the independent inquiry. Dr. Coates, when he gave evidence, he was one of the consultant physicians at uh, Midstaffs. He felt that there was some split between clinicians and patients on the one hand and managers and the government on the other hand. Um, there, are, ob there is obviously, I think, influence of managers on clinicians in the NHS. I sent around a paper to the various heads of uh, the Royal Colleges and the BMA and so on, and I suggested that um, the major factors are jobs for the junior doctors. There is a reduction of the number of hospital posts, so obviously managers and their clinical bosses have a large influence on junior doctors. Um, consultants. Uh, their clinical excellence awards, which can increase, on a small number of cases, can increase their income by 90%, their NHS income, uh, but generally is much less. Uh, managers are now very involved in the decisions while regarding those. In the Royal Colleges, there is a question of patronage. Knighthoods, even, can be given. And generally the funding. Now, there wasn't anybody in the circular that I sent around who disagreed with this among the clinicians that I was talking to in the various organizations. In addition, there have been external reports on the National Health Service which were commissioned by Aradazi in a review of the NHS um, which uh, were published in Jul January and February 2000. Uh, eight, and they were clear that there are problems. One of the factors which was mentioned in inquiry many times so far is the culture of fear pervades the NHS. Um, managers look up, not, not out. These reports were not actually made available until January 2010 after a freedom, freedom of information request. So, to summarise the political pressures which were mentioned by the people who gave evidence to the Midstaff's public inquiry. Uh, the actual evidence has, been, has finished. We've had 139 days of hearings, 189 people gave evidence. And I say I was one of them. It was a whole day of six hours of grilling. You sit there with the inquiry chairman, the uh, lead counsel questioning you. But on the other side, there are 24 barristers. That's uh, legal people, attorneys, uh, who represent the people whom you might criticise, such as the Department of Health, and they are able to ask you questions via the barrister or directly themselves. So it's a very forensic questioning, and the, the questioning tends to be of the type that um, there is a sort of key question uh, that they want to get you at, uh, to you at about a particular subject, but they will close every possible way out that you have when they do the questioning and then they ask the key question.
Um, but it's not exactly the same as a trial in that it's meant to be investigative rather than and, and looking into things rather than inquisitorial. But it, uh, it is quite difficult. So the, I'm giving the, now the evidence that was given by the three main chairmen of the three main regulators. So first of all, there's Dr. William Moyes, who was the chairman of Monis. All three of them, by the way, were either removed or resigned. Um, and Bill Moyes said that the culture of the NHS is not to embarrass the minister. Don't do anything to embarrass the minister. The... Ian Kennedy, who was the uh, chairman of the Bristol Inquiry, but also later on the chairman of the Health Care Commission, uh, said that his view was the Department of Health, the collection and analysis of information about safety and quality of care provided by the NHS was not part of their agenda. The Department of Health is responsible for the quality and monitoring quality of care. The chair of the Bristol Inquiry and the chair of the Healthcare Commission is saying the Department of Health is not interested. Uh, the third one was uh, the chairman, um, Barbara Young, uh, Baroness Barbara Young, chair of the Care Quality Commission, and she uh, went on for quite a long time. She said there's huge government pressure because the government hated the idea that a regulator would criticise it by dint of criticising one of the hospitals, one of the services responsible for. Because the, 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 the government is in a difficult situation that is responsible for providing the, uh, the NHS service, but also for monitoring it. And politically, it, it cannot be seen to be providing a poor service. So all three of these people were saying, ultimately, that the, we had to give a good news story to the minister. So the minister was brought on, and his conclusion was that the impression of all of us was that we would just, you know, constantly do what was meant to be the thing that number 10 wanted. Now, number 10 is the Prime Minister and number 10 Downing Street, and HSMRs were debated at number 10 Downing Street, and decisions were taken, and the minister who was responding to the criticisms after the publication of the Midstaff's inquiry uh, the, from the Health Care Commission was told to say, for instance, that the data were only available from 2007, whereas in fact they were also told that it was available from 2001. So now this is the point where I hand over, over to Paul. I meant to do a little bit of interactive questioning here. Um, as you read through these questions, I'd like you to ask yourself, um, could any of the things that you've just heard be happening in your organization? And having watched several inquiries now in different countries, it's a fascinating thing to wonder, could these exact things be going on? If you take the recommendations from the Bristol inquiry, the Manitoba inquiry, the Nijmegen inquiry, or the Garling inquiry, or the Mid-Staffordshire, they look eerily similar. If you change the name, just look at the processes that were overlooked, you find a series of very, very similar drivers, so much so that one of my colleagues, uh, when asked to participate in an inquiry, he said, why produce another inquiry? This just takes one of the other ones, cut out the names, and just take those recommendations. We'd save a lot of money and time. And it's not that facetious, although it is important to make it very locally. What I want to talk about is normalized deviance. Um, how many of you have heard of that term? So this is a uniquely powerful term that I think is very, very central to Mid-Staffordshire. In fact, it's central to why it's so difficult to get clinicians to change their behavior. Diane Vaughn, a sociologist at Boston College, after the Challenger disaster, coined this term when risks are very, very evident across the organization and they're systematically ignored at the micro level, the meso level, and the macro level, they become normalized. They stop becoming a risk. As it turned out, the Challenger disaster happened on the coldest day of any other launches. In fact, it violated the rules of launching. And so it wasn't just the O-ring, it was, it was the freezing together with the O-ring that ultimately breached the risk parameters. 
But what was behind that was a culture that went on for many, many years. And um, when she talks about normalized deviance, she talks about the fact that it, can't, it doesn't just begin. There's a so, slow process of institutionalization of normalized deviance. And I'm going to give you examples of that. It's not just one space. It turns out that normalized deviance is like bad MRSA. It spreads like a bug. And when it starts to spread, it's very difficult to contain it. So what is apparent in many of these inquiries is that the problems weren't across the organization immediately. They begin in one entity, and they slowly start to promulgate over 10, 12 years, so much so that they stop becoming a problem. This is what uh, is apparent in multiple inquiries, and this is what Diane uh, Vaughn uh, found at NASA. What's also very interesting, she suggests, is that it begins in one company or corporation and then spreads to the rest so that it's acceptable to have high mortality. It's acceptable to have high incidence of pneumothorothes. It's acceptable to have pressure sores. Now, you might recall that before the work that Peter Pronovos and others, I'm an intensivist, it was very common that I was taught, and many would say, that every ICU has multiple patients with central line infections. In fact, when the first data came out, and still, people don't believe that it's possible to go 150 days without one infection. They must be moving the goal mark. Something must be going on. This is the exact flip side of that, which is that it's impossible not to have that, this mental model which needs to be addressed. Now, all these inquiries, and, and again, we don't have enough time to go through them, but just I'll say a few words about um, the Garling. The Garling is an inquiry that happened in New South Wales several years ago after a 17-year-old girl was hit by a golf ball um, and died because of poor transitions of care, poor supervision, and ultimately in a very sophisticated tertiary hospital in Sydney, uh, her death uh, was completely preventable. What became very clear from the inquiry is that multiple people said, we knew there were problems in the system. In in fact, we've known this for years. And finally, Justice uh, Garling said, I'm really fed up with this investigation. Half of you keep on telling me that you have all the answers. Why haven't you done anything about it? And it's a fascinating quote from a legal perspective. Why it would be okay. He so much has, has said that if everybody knew all this stuff, it's criminal not to act. If you knew there was so much variation, if you knew there were so many infections, why did you not step into the breach? This is the Raudbad investigation at Nijmegen. This was a, a, cardiac, a cardiovascular investigation that went on for several years. And I put this here in the original Dutch, uh, and all you need to see here is the timetable. The problems began in 1998. Um, people started talking about that in 2003. It finally got exposed in 2005 and went public at the end of 2007 nine to ten years. In the inquiry, it became very clear that multiple people in the system knew that there were problems. The mortality of several surgeons were several fold higher than the average. And yet, the surgeons, the anesthetists, the intensivists, the cardiologists, the managers knew that the data was heavily skewed compared to their colleagues in different centers in the Netherlands, and nothing happened. It was only when a new anesthetist, and there's something must be wrong with anesthetists, we're just born with strange genes, but a new professor of anesthesia comes on board, he starts working in the OR, and he's very concerned by what he sees, and he writes an email to his colleagues and he says, I don't know about you, but I would not want my care to be at this hospital. That gets leaked to the newspapers, and all hell breaks loose in the Netherlands. Then he's fired. Then the entire board is fired. An entire investigation goes on and, and to really look, how could this have gone on for so many years, for nine years? And it's clear from emails and it's clear from documents that people knew that this was going on, and yet nobody acted. So normalization and deviance, where else do we see that? I would argue that we know across the world that the average number of physicians that wash their hands is about 40%. Do you think that would be accepted as a normalized deviance? How about the fact that we don't follow isolation protocols? Or how about the fact that we wear hospital scrubs home? Do you think that's normalized deviance? It sounds a bit extreme, but how many of you have ever worn your scrubs to or from the hospital? Well, just to make sure that it was real, so I checked with Brian yesterday, and it turns out we're going to get personal here, Brian. So Brian's son is a very eminent cardiologist, and we were talking about the fact that he goes and comes from the hospital in scrubs. This is a common norm. We still do that. Even though the bugs come from the hospital, go back home, the machines at home cannot clean off the bugs, so now we're spreading it to the family. Then we go back to the hospital through Starbucks, back into the OR, back home again. Is that not normalized deviance? Is there anybody that thinks that that's not a bad practice? Do any of you have policies about wearing scrubs to and from the hospital? How often do people violate those policies? Come on, how often? How often? 
daily. All you have to do is look at the cafeteria in your hospital across the street, and it's full of clinicians in scrubs with a white coat, which is supposed to protect the bugs from going in or going out. I'm not quite sure. But think about it for a moment. These are people going into sterile spaces with those same scrubs. So this is an, uh, an example of what Diane talks about, a risk that's a, it's in plain view. There's nothing secretive about those scrubs. We all know what goes on. It even says on the side, do not take your scrubs home. They're printed in big black embossed letters but because of a property reason. So how does it start? The normalized deviance suggests that permissive ethical climate allows this slow deviation from what's acceptable norms, and ultimately it leads to immoral action. And Brian alluded to that. It begins by a misunderstanding of the data, it starts by ambiguity, and then it leads to outright lying. And that's what has become apparent in many of these inquiries, um, or what she talks about. It contributes to the managerial decisions to initiate deviance. Now, here's another example. I don't know if you've seen this data. This is from the U.S., 10,000 patients. This is the difference in outcomes from non-emergent major surgery from Monday to Wednesday compared to Thursday to Sunday. Do you think there's a difference in outcomes? How big is the difference? 5%? 10%? 15%? 20%? How about 36%? That's it. All else being equal, match for 67 different parameters. The only difference being that you get operated in the beginning of the week versus the latter part of the week. We've known this for about 40 years, by the way, and the HSMR data have shown that weekend procedures are much more riskier um, by simply being on the weekend. We've known about CPR that at least 50 to 60 percent of people do not do CPR according to the American Hospital Association guidelines, even though every year in the U.S. we force clinicians to do a training in heart guidelines, and yet more than half don't do it by the guidelines. We've known this for about 30 years. Again, imagine again the normalized deviance where it's okay to ignore the guidelines, even though they're mandatory guidelines. There's nothing voluntary about them. They're considered to be the standard of care. And in a court of law, they in fact are used as a standard of care. Here's another example. We've done some work on the dangers of the July effect or the August effect in the UK or the February effect in Australia. How much more dangerous are interns than other physicians? Or more specifically, in the first few months of their internship year, how much more dangerous is to be treated by an intern? According to recent studies out of Australia, 15 to 20 percent. But it's not just the first year. For all registrars, they're more dangerous in the first three months than the rest of the year. It levels off after about month four. And so again, what are we doing in the system with these junior trainees? How are we changing the rostering, ensuring that there's more coverage, ensuring that July, which is vacation month, so most of the attendings are away? These are the types of very serious issues that as a system we're still saying, well, and in fact a recent paper came out in the Annals of Internal Medicine that said that there's no hard evidence that July is more dangerous than other months. Any of you Want to weigh a hand in is that? Do you think July or August in the UK is more dangerous than other months? The evidence, when you do a meta-analysis, shows that it's probably sort of 50-50, which is really interesting. How could that be, given all of our experiences? So very quickly to non-medical domains. This is the Columbia shuttle. And what's interesting about the Columbia shuttle is that after they did their investigation, what became very clear is that the Columbia, which crashed in 2003, suffered from the exact same problems that led to the Challenger disaster 17 years earlier. It was a different problem. But what, what the investigative board identified was the culture the normalized deviance that was forgotten over those years. And so without going into the details because of the time, what's very clear about this very interesting organization, NASA, was that 17 years earlier, this thing that after 73 seconds uh, blew up, in fact what became apparent is that people within the organization said, we have a problem, it's dangerous, we should not launch. And I'm going to show you a memo in just a moment. But what the conclusion of the committee was, the NASA organizational culture had as much to do with the accident as the foam. You remember the foam that broke off. So how could culture be so central in the NHS, in the Midstaff inquiry, in the Nijmegen inquiry, in the Challenger disaster? How could culture be such a corroding effect that allows thousands of people in these organizations to know these issues and not do anything about it? This is what the Washington Post on the first day, front cover. The culture is what caused the problem, not the O-rings, not the foam, but the culture that allowed the decisions to be made. And I'll, uh, again, this is a fascinating quote, cultural norms tend to be fairly resilient. The norms bounce back after being stretched or bent. 
what they're speaking to is after 17 years, all the changes that were implemented in NASA, they had all gone back to the risky culture before um, the previous disaster. So here are the stages, and I'd like you to think about your own organizations. Could any of this be relevant? Number one, institutionalization refers to the process by which a decision that's clearly on the edge becomes acceptable. Then it's rationalized. Our patients are sicker. We do it differently. We're in the difficult part of town. We have no money to have more nurses per patient. And then it finally becomes part of the norm. So new people that come on board, they become socialized. This is the pattern that Diane Vaughn and others and Ashford and Annan suggest are really quite central to the normalized deviants getting traction. And even new people can't quite address it. And what's interesting about Nijmegen, about Midstaff, and about Bristol is that it's new people that came on board that suddenly said, there's something wrong here. They did not accept the fact that it was that way all the time because they were new. They had no knowledge from the organization before they came on board. And again, here are various stakeholder reactions. In these cultures, what they speak about is the way to combat this normalized deviance is focusing on what they call is social control agents. And what they mean by that is constant challenges, transparency, if you will, by, by making the data available. And Brian alluded to that. One of the goals of HSMR is to give power is to give tools to the community and patients to hold the hospital accountable. Not because HSMR is the most reliable tool, not because it's the only tool, it has a unique set of statistical challenges, but as a vehicle to shine a bright light and say, what is going on with this trend? That then gave power to Julie Bailey and other colleagues to ask tough questions about Midstaff, even though for 10 years it was well known for at least 2001 but it wasn't available readily to the public, uh, at least for all those years. I'm going to skip that for a moment. So um, we've talked about this. Now, again, Brian alluded to this. The patterns that are very similar in Bristol and Midstaff is that the adjusted death rates are high for about 10 years. There's an internal investigation that says there's no problem. There's rationalization and there's socialization. This is the normalized deviance that we talked about earlier. There's, there's uh, um, patients groups that complain that are ignored. There's on-site investigations that then finds an appalling standard of care. A public inquiry makes recommendations and hopefully again, this happens again. So if you look at this sequence, Bristol was 20-odd years ago, 10 years had gone by, another sequence came by after the lessons were forgotten, this so-called hindsight cycle. Now, again, the similarities about things were ignored. The action was only on an external forced investigation. The difference is, of course, was that in Bristol, when they found out there were problems, Bristol initiated major changes, and today Bristol has some of the best outcomes in all of Europe, which is fascinating. In fact, after about 24 months after the investigation, they started to have the best data in the UK, and they've continued to have fabulous data. That's uh, the mid-staff data suggests that, in fact, even after um, the, the, the lights were shown on the hospital, they still continue to have very, very um, un unacceptable data. So um, to conclude the, this issue around organizational findings that comes from sociology, these six elements are very powerful vehicles to combat the normalized deviance, and we believe to deal with some of these political pressures. Number one, this maintained sense of vulnerability that these problems will continue to happen. Number two, this normalized deviance, being aware of how it gets institutionalized, how it gets traction. Again, the analogy to MRSA and bugs like that is a good one. It's really hard to get rid of them from the hospital. They hide in the ICU. Unless you put on the right pair of glasses, you can't see them, but they're there. They're just waiting for the right patient who's immune suppressed to suddenly latch on to them. This imperative for safety, which becomes extremely clear in all these inquiries, there's a lack of awareness to the fact that safety is a central driver, the need to constantly perform these, these proactive risk assessments, these frank communications, and finally the culture. Um, here's some fascinating quotes. Daniel Golden from NASA, when I ask for the budget to be cut, I'm told it's going to impact safety. I think that's a bunch of crap. This is the CEO of NASA saying that safety will be damaged when we cut the budget. Th this was how the culture started to deviate. Um, here's another fascinating quote on the bottom. This is a memo that was not sent. It was typed, but it wasn't sent. I must emphasize again that severe enough damage could present potentially grave hazards. Remember NASA safety posters everywhere stating, if it's not safe, say so. Yes, it's that serious. <laughs> 
Somebody felt compelled to say all those memos on the bulletin board, safety is central. No, hospitals use these logos. Safety is our business. It's what we're about. Okay, so NASA would have all this campaign about safety. So this person wanted to send it, but ultimately, because of pressure, who said, don't do it or you'll lose your job, he typed it out, but he never actually sent it, which is reminiscent of the chief medical officer at Bristol who listened to Steve Bolson, then put all the information in a safe and did nothing about it for years. And then the inquiry, when he was asked about it, he pretty much acknowledged he knew it was an issue, but he couldn't quite deal with the consequences, so he put it in a safe as an insurance policy, which ultimately led to his departure. So, not maintaining a sense of vulnerability, safety performance has to be good. The question is, what if? How could things go wrong? So when you hear that a sister hospital has a wrong side surgery, a medication error, what does that mean for your hospital? Do you wait until you have that, or now do you analyze, doing a failure mode and effects analysis, because it could happen to you tomorrow. And the statistics of wrong side surgery suggest about one in 9,000 cases, but that doesn't mean that it won't happen twice in your hospital immediately. It means that when you take a collective average, it's one in 9,000. So that's a very important uh, uh, action around that. The second thing, of course, is how do we prevent the normalization? So obviously outside agents, transparency, willful conscious violation of procedures cannot be tolerated. And it's clear in all these inquiries that procedures were violated on a regular basis. Um, tolerating practices or conditions that would have been deemed unacceptable a year or two ago. So this is a way to clearly put a stop to that and say, what are we doing um, that should be uh, changed? The imperative for safety, um, staff monitoring, there's a lot of things that, that have been discussed at the conference. I'm not going to reiterate that. But what's clear, what's very clear, is that insiders have a hard time seeing patterns. And so just like in the military, when we were in special ops, you bring an outside person to identify the weakness of our perimeter. Imagine for a moment, if you're an executive, that every hospital periodically brings in an outsider to say, this looks great, but there's things that you're not seeing because you've seen it for so often. This is a clear message from the inquiries. Insiders, after a while, even when they're well-intentioned, have a hard time seeing changes in the patterns, unless they're dramatic changes. But small changes, like watching your child grow, is very difficult, except when you look back at a picture and you go, whoa, I didn't realize that that had happened, because every day it's so incrementally small. And of course, this issue of performing timely hazard assessments, failure mode and effects analysis, and dealing with that uh, on a regular basis. Um, I want to end this section on this issue of psychological safety. Amy Edmondson, a professor at Harvard Business School, talks about um, the central element of high reliability organizations is the ability of employees and staff and executives to say there's a problem. It's the ability of SHA and area managers to say to the minister there's a problem. But what was common in these audits and what's common in the inquiries, including in Australia, is that the CEOs of the hospitals were told, make sure there's no bad news in the newspapers. That's one of your KPIs. Keep it out of the newspapers. That's almost as important as keeping your budget balanced. Guess what that message transmits to the entire executive team? Whatever happens, make sure we bury it here. And so these are almost verbatim quotes from people in these systems who say we're afraid to speak up because the message is clear. We cannot talk about this. And it's common in Nijmegen, it's common in Bristol, it's common in Midstaff, and it's common in Garling. And that's the scary part. Over 25 years, the same theme of this political insidious pressure that keeps executives from doing the right thing, even though they know it's not the right thing, and either they get, and when they do speak up, they get moved aside, or they get shut out as whistleblowers, or, or frankly, they're unable to actually address the issue directly. So, of course, all this leads to the culture, a culture of safety, and the ability to actually speak to these things directly without having to compromise your integrity, without compromising the values of your organization, and without losing the joy and value that these people bring um, to their uh, work. So I'm going to hand it over to Brian to wrap this up. So what we need in all of this, I think, is to be able to stand back and take a balanced look at what's going on. We, we have within the National Health Service and in most healthcare systems a means of auditing every single admission of every patient on a continuous basis, uh, even daily, but certainly monthly, and we can work out the chances of death of that patient and the actual numbers of deaths. And this will lead to a system which we call cumulative sum, Q-sum analysis, uh, which ultimately allows us to send a mortality alert confidentially to the chief executives of hospitals who have high death rates in particular diagnoses. So this is an example of a mortality alert. 
This is 863 patients, and each one of these is, uh, is one patient, these little blips. And the, the graph goes up if it, a loss, if it's a, if it's a low risk and the patient dies, a little if it's a high risk and the patient dies, and down if they don't die. And you eventually get to a point where this has reached significance and where the false alarm rate is less than 0.1%, i.e. less than one in a thousand chance that this is a false alarm. And at that point, we send a letter to the chief executives of the trust to let them know, and we copy this letter to the Healthcare Commission. Now, these are sent confidentially, and they give them a chance to examine what's actually going on, and we get letters back which indicate that hospitals have taken this seriously. They don't feel it is a massive threat because it's giving them information right up to date, or as up to date as they submit their own data. A um, couple of examples of use of this, the, the Royal Bolton Trust, uh, we know that if you operate quickly after admission, you get lower death rates. We've published a paper on the subject, and they decided they would try and reduce it after they had an alert. They actually had their alert here, September 2004, and they, investigated, uh, they intervened about here and reduced the, uh, the uh, time between admission and operation and appointed an orthopedic geriatrician full-time. And the death rate when they started was above, of a fractured neck of femur was above 25% and has reduced to below 5%. And the numbers of deaths reduced, had they stayed at that level, not increased even, just stayed at that level, the numbers of deaths has gone down by about nearly 200 by now. So it is possible the actual, also the length of stays stayed down, and patients were very happy with the arrangements that were put in place. And this is really a, an actual measure of the triple aim, improving the outcomes, uh, lowering the cost, and improving patient uh, assessments. This is just a new innovation we've just introduced, or we haven't introduced, being int tried in some UK hospitals of remote videoing for things like... Uh, hand hygiene, uh, critical care, patient being turned, and uh, surgery, what goes on in surgery. And these are just examples of things that could be done to reduce this political pressure and introduce a manageable means of looking at the data in a practical way of making real measurable improvements. So Ian Kennedy said he doubted that uh, we would actually be able to deal with the problems if we are so exposed to political winds. When you have HSMRs being discussed at cabinet level, we have the things which have been said by the chairman of the inquiries. Obviously, you are in a difficult situation. You have to get to a point where it is made objective, clear, and can be used without threat by the hospitals. So we need to do all these various things that have been listed here, learning and so on, and I think the lessons in particular, we have to understand. We've got to understand the problems that uh, these managers have, uh, which make life difficult. They're being torn in two directions. The chairman of these, the, of these regulators are saying we are being pulled in both directions. Um, we must make sure that uh, lessons are learned. And in particular, uh, I think it's important to remember the importance of publication of data, of being as open as you possibly can with information which is properly adjusted in order that patients can actually learn and instead of being told yours is unique, they can actually say, well, no, there is, seems to be a problem here. Let's, and I think the attitude of patients is let us try to help our hospital get better so other patients don't suffer the same problems. So I think we have uh, five minutes for questions, if anyone, there's one already, very quick. Uh, we can choose, you know, just say who you want to answer. Well, I don't think either of you will want to answer my question. <laughs> who are you? I'm Stella Stevens from Australia. Um, thank you for a marvellous uh, session. My question is, um, why wasn't this the keynote addressed yesterday afternoon instead of that racing car stuff? And did, was that a political decision? <laughs> well, <laughs> I must admit, I was sitting with Don Berwick and Maureen Bissignano uh, at the back of the room, and I did wonder about that because he said that he was... Uh, 
working with Birmingham, who actually was the group that uh, were employed to, um, to try to discredit our work, and uh, also with Great Ormond Street. Now, the day beforehand, there was an investigation of Great Ormond Street on the BBC, uh, publicised on television, and one of the problems was of um, Kim Holt, a doctor, who tried... To, it's actually not Great Ormond Street itself. It was actually a peripheral hospital who had tried to draw attention to the problems, uh, it seems, and uh, I mean, from what I gather... Um, she was offered £100,000 to keep quiet and turned it down and actually did blow the whistle. Steve Bolson blew the whistle. Semmelweis blew the whistle in 1830 when he talked about the hand hygiene. Um, Codman had problems. Semmelweis was actually put into uh, uh, an asylum uh, with, with the agreement of his wife, actually, uh, which I often wondered why. But anyhow... He, other, appar other? Apparently, he was beaten up as he entered and died <laughs> two weeks later. It's not all that easy, and that might be partially an answer to your question. Thanks. Yes. Uh, John Hoonan from the Netherlands, working with the HMSR and uh, Gospels as well. I worry a little bit after your talk, and uh, both of you, because... It, You're meant to worry. <laughs> uh, yeah, because, well, but um, I still am a, it, it's a lot of cynical uh, attitude towards politicians, and I don't know if I really want to go there. I also want, I uh, how can it. we change our politicians? Because it's not that we have health care here and our politicians on the other hand, and that we should be afraid of politicians that they're doing always the wrong thing for health care. So I also wonder if you had, have advice how we can be citizens and educate our politicians to do the right things for health care because it's all about an issue that's really close to a heart or what we think is worthwhile in life. And if we feel that politicians are doing the things that are not the right thing for us all, there is something deeply wrong. And I don't know if I want to go there. <laughs> Can I, can I just say that Barbara Young, Baroness Young, tried to deal with your question by saying that healthcare is unique in that the governments are responsible, at least in the UK, for the provision of healthcare and the monitoring. And she was suggesting, I believe, that you should try to separate those things. And the white paper, which was brought out in July 2010, tried to devolve the responsibility both for the costing and for the monitoring, down to these primary care uh, groups, the, the clinical commissioning groups. That would be so a wise the, political that, decision to, to that, split that, those functions. That was, was what the aim, I believe, partly the aim of that. And what politicians actually have in the UK for decades tried to do. But there was some form of opposition to this uh, change. However, the, the, um, for various different reasons. Yeah, and let me also... From but to a certain extent, your, your question is very important, I think. And it has been tackled to a certain extent by certain people who gave evidence to the inquiry. I mean, I'm not making the, the criticism of the politicians. These are, I'm reporting the criticisms that were made. It's a hugely important question. Um, Bob McNamara, who was the American uh, Secretary of Defense who took the U.S. into Vietnam, wrote a very powerful book about how the smartest people from the best universities in the U.S. at the time were able to get it so wrong. And he talks about the key message to avoid that is more transparency of decision making. This is not something you solve, this is something that you manage. By making this information more available, different types of information, by educating the public, you keep the politicians more accountable. If you don't, they will slide into what you're talking about. We might not want to go there, but the reality is it's there right now. And so that type of corruption of power is not new. The question is, as it relates to health care, is what are the consequences for our ability to get the proper resources, to get the right signals? And what's very clear is that when we don't hold them accountable, these inquiries suggest that the entire system suffers, not just locally. But again, I want to remind you that comment from Diane Vaughn. Normalization deviance is like a bug. When it starts in one organization, it spreads to the entire system. And I think it's a hugely powerful metaphor for how we keep our politicians more accountable. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Fantastic presentation. And, and what you've just said there, Paul, I think is, is, is really important. The, the politicians, without defending them, have an incredibly hard job to do. Um, they're being held more accountable than ever, and so they want to push some of that downhill, as it were. Unfortunately, in health systems, particularly public health systems, that leads to this feeling amongst the clinicians at the coalface that the Minister for Health is standing behind them every time they're pushing a syringe in. 
And they do so, they assert this pressure, not only by the appointment of the, of the people at the higher levels of the department, but by creating these little organisations, give, giving them names like Ethical Standards Unit, um, to police good behaviour and to, to be investigated by one of these units, you know, is to be, to be the suggestion of a doctor or nurse that's unethical is like having a knife stabbed in your heart and twisted around because it's all about behaviour and behaviour modification. Um, this isn't having a go at any particular side of politics because I've worked for both. Um, but what you said there, uh, I, I was delighted to hear you say it, that the best way to get around it is by education. If you're in front of the TV camera, you tell the truth. If you're briefing the minister, you tell the truth, because ultimately we are health leaders and we have to have our integrity. Thanks. Great, great point. I think it's just important to mention that uh, you know, whistleblowing in various forms and shapes are part of keeping organizations safe. And the research on whistleblowing has suggested that people get there because they have no choice to go through the regular channels. They're not trying to be outsiders. They try in their own subtle ways, and ultimately they bring down the system. Interestingly enough, many of them tend to be women, um, which the researcher has suggested, and, and, and there's a whole discussion around where that comes from. But what's important about that is that by not empowering colleagues to speak up authentically, ultimately it actually breeds more pressure for more whistleblowing, which leads to more scandals. So in fact, by the less transparency you impose, the more coercion you cause to create more outside organizational structures. So. Ten seconds. It's a yep. Western paper in Quality yep. and Safety in Healthcare in 2005. Don't beat your whistleblowers, train them. That's right. I love that. We have time for one final question, and then uh, our time is wrapped up. Any other thoughts or comments, or how does this relate to your own organizations? Yes. I'm Marie Misla from the Alien for Patient Safety, and uh, I have a question. Uh, what, what's your solution uh, for peer review, internal peer review? Should we not try to create external peer review? Brian, do you want to take that? Uh, the impression that I had in the, these different inquiries was the, um, they, they all had internal peer review and investigations, but no action was actually taken if the, the, the pressures internally were so great. And that in both instances, uh, it was the external uh, review that was effective. Now, I don't think that's the reason why you shouldn't have internal peer review, but you, it does need to have good information to be able to deal with it. So if you take the, I mean, the, I have to say that the mortality alerts, we get pages of data from the clinicians that looked at it. If ultimately nothing happens, then that is a, a, a fault of the system. But I, I think you have to try to build in a method of actually acting on problems that are found. And it's much easier to act when people come from outside. Okay, if you have anything, mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you. No. I think that's it. Thank you. Thanks.